This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. On the evening of June 17, 2015, a young white supremacist went into an AME church in Charleston, South Carolina, participated in the, in the Bible study that night, and then during prayer, shot nine people and killed them all. America kind of held its collective breath, waiting to see if this indeed would start the racial war that uh, this young supremacist wanted. The leader of that Bible study was Myra Thompson. With me today is, is Anthony Thompson. He's the pastor. Uh, he's the pastor of Holy Trinity Reformed Episcopal Church in South Carolina. And Anthony, thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Bob. Now, before we get into anything about this, this killer, uh, I really want you to introduce the audience to Myra and what you meant to each other. Well, Myra was a very extraordinary woman. She and I met while we were in college, and she, uh, from the very beginning, she let me know that she was not a woman of foolishness. <laughs> she, wanted to get, she wanted to get her degree. She was about education, and that she was not looking for a boyfriend or any type of relationship. And so I respected that of her, and from that respect, she and I just, I continued to carry her back and forth to Charleston from, from Benedict College back home. And this is how we got to know each other. Mm -hmm. uh, found out that she was a very giving person. Besides having a master's degree in reading and a master's in counseling and being a teacher and a counselor and a pastor, her greatest gift was giving. She was about the biggest person I know. She would give her last. When I say her last, I mean I knew it because her last sometimes was my last. Mm -hmm. And so she, everything she did was for the, to benefit someone else. And she, was, she had just received her, her ministry license. And this was going to be, this was the first Bible study that she taught with, officially with that new ministry license that night, right? That night. She would have, her ministry license would have, would have been reinstated. But that would have been her first time teaching Bible study. And she was very excited about that. She spent almost a couple of months trying to put that together. Now, just as a, as a thumbnail, take us through, and I know it's one of those things you don't really like to rehash in your, in your memory, but take us through June 17th of 2015, just as a thumbnail, what happened if, if our audience for some reason doesn't know? Well, on June 17th, 2015, I was at my church conducting a Bible vacation school, and Myra, of course, was teaching Bible study. I wanted to be there, but for some reason, she did not want me to be there that night. So when I got home, I received a phone call from one of the members of Emmanuel Church telling me that some shooting was going on around the church. So I immediately dropped the phone, got in my car, and immediately got downtown because we, we're not too far from Emmanuel Church. So I was like one of the first persons on the scene. Once I discovered that my wife had been killed, of course, that's when I lost control. Mm -hmm. And I just laid down Calhoun Street pavement, just wallowing, crying just uncontrollably. And while I was doing this, a voice came to me saying, get up. And at first I thought it was maybe one of the first responders because it was a very harsh voice. And then it said it to me twice. I realized it wasn't anybody but God himself telling me to get up. And I know that voice because I've heard that voice when I was seven years old. He told me I was going to be a preacher, and I told him no. <laughs> and I heard that voice for until I reached 35 years of age, until I went to the seminary. So I knew it was him. And he reminded me of a lot of the messages I gave my congregation uh, at any given time about if you lost a loved one, a wife or a husband, or son or daughter, and you love them more than you love the Lord, then what would you do? And so he had me at this point. And of course, I didn't want to hear it. Of I didn't course. want to hear anything he had to say. Not yeah. one word. Yeah, your focus would have had to have been on the devastation that was around, going yes. on around the AME Church, Emmanuel AME Church at that time. Yes, it was. Because a lot of things happened that I, that I did not tell you about. But at that point, I was frustrated. You know, I was a little angry, I was saddened, I was worried because I didn't know whether she had died or whether she was 
had been shot, still suffering, and it was just miserable. And uh, I tried my best to get into the church, and someone snatched me back. Later on, I found out it was an FBI agent. It took about five people to hold me down. Mm -hmm. I can imagine. And going through those next 48 hours, I mean, dealing with yes. the fact that she really was dead, that she really was gone, and then coming up to the time of, of this guy's bail hearing, his bond hearing, what yes. took place there? I mean, you had, you had adult children, and you really yes. didn't want to go to that hearing, right? No, I didn't. No, I really didn't want to go. However, we went. And, 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 you, and you, hadn't seen, you hadn't seen this man before, this, this killer? I'd never seen him. Yeah. Didn't even know his name. Mm -hmm. Had no idea who he was. Had no interest in who he was. Because my wife was the only thing on my mind. Mm -hmm. The only person on my mind was her. So what happened at the bail hearing, the bond hearing? Well, at the bond hearing, I received the same message. I told my, my two adult kids, I said, when Nadine gets through speaking, we're going to leave. So they were given an opportunity. They were giving the the families an opportunity to speak at this hearing. Is that correct? Yes, the okay. magistrate gave, which was unusual mm -hmm. in the magistrate hearing, and um, this is one reason why I didn't want to be there because I was an agent for 27 years. I took people to bond hearings all the time. I didn't see it to be very important. However, I was there. And I was about to leave, and Nadine spoke first. She was one of the. Um, the daughter of one of the victims, and God said again, get up. I have something to say. And I'm walking to the podium, and I'm saying, well, Lord, if you have something to say, you better tell me what it is, because I don't have anything to say. So you did, you did not yeah. want to speak at that hearing, but God says, I've got something to say, and you're going, yes. to be my, you're going to be my mouthpiece. Yes, I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to say anything. As a matter of fact, I was about ready to leave. Yeah. How, how, did, that, how did that come out? I mean, when you heard yourself saying this, tell us what mm -hmm. you said, but when you heard yourself saying it, did you, did you feel that it was the Lord saying it through you? Well, I know it was him because all I can see in that entire room was Dylan in front of me and myself. I didn't see anybody else. And immediately, I just opened my mouth and I said, I forgive you, my family forgive you, but we would like you to take this opportunity to repent, confess, repent, give your life to the one that means the most, to Christ. When I said Christ, he did lift up his head, and he did glance at me, so he heard what I was saying. And I went on to say that no matter what happens to you right now, if you do that, everything else will be okay. And immediately... After I said that immediately, when God began to deal with me, my body was shaking. It felt like some things were leaving me. And what I realized, he freed me. You know, I received a peace like no other. That peace that surpasses all of this understanding of Christ Jesus, that's the peace I experienced. I preached that sermon many times. And I thought I had that peace, and I thought my congregation had that peace. But we didn't have it. But I did have it that day. And I still have it right now today. And that piece is what, is what enabled me to move forward in my life right now. What, what amazes me is you're standing there, you look, I mean, this, this guy was on camera, he was, on a, he was in a different room, but he's on video. And mm -hmm. you're looking at his face, he won't look you in the eye, but at the same time you're forgiving him. Did, did, you, did you just really want to reach through the camera and grab him by the throat? I mean, where, was there any anger at that time? No, I wasn't angry at all. Wow. I, wasn't, I wasn't angry even before I got up, even before God said anything, I wasn't angry. Mm -hmm. you know, I just wanted to get out of there. But again, God intervened. And, and, and when he intervened, and I, and I forgave Dylan, that's when I experienced that peace, which I have right now today. And, and that, that's what amazed everyone. I mean, the media had just swamped Charleston, South Carolina, the media was all over the place because they really were expecting mm -hmm. some kind of a reaction, some kind of a response from the community yes. that, that could possibly be violent. And that's what they yes. were looking for. But in this case, they were, I think they were overwhelmed by the fact that you had forgiven this man and at the same time offered him Jesus Christ. And yes. the media was trying to figure out, what does all this mean? Yeah, I know. Everybody was in awe because nobody expected that. Everybody expected the usual, and that is for us to get violent, burn down the city, get mad, probably grab a white person and try to beat them to death. But 
those were not God's intentions. Neither were my intentions. When he intervened, it just changed everything. Yeah. What, what did happen in Charleston then? Well, the community was united. People from every walks of life, every creed, every denomination, every culture came together and helped each other in every way possible to console each other, to comfort each other. The Confederate flag came down when nobody was talking about the flag. You know, President Obama came and, and he delivered the eulogy for uh, Reverend Clemente Pinckney's funeral. And the first time I heard him even talk about racism. And that's what we're doing now in the city of Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have different forums we're talking about racial reconciliation. The mayor of our city, Mayor Tecklenburg, has formed an advisory committee of pastors. And the focus is on racial reconciliation, repentance, and forgiveness. As a matter of fact, just a couple of days ago, he opened a position to hire somebody to be the director of racial reconciliation department. Wow. That is amazing. And, and, and God, you, you authored this book called To Forgive. It's an amazing book as people read through that. One of the things I want to ask you about, and, and it's, I see it in the book, and I'm just, just do we need to know that, did you, did you have a, a, a desire for uh, this guy, this Dylan Roof, did you have a desire for him to understand what was going on or to, to some reciprocity that he would accept your forgiveness? Did you need to hear well, that? No, I didn't need to hear him accept my forgiveness. You know, forgiveness is not determined by someone accepting your forgiveness because the forgiveness is not for the offender. The forgiveness is for the victim. And this is why God put me in that position. He wanted me to have that peace. He knew what I was going through. He knew what I was struggling with. So he led me to forgive this guy so I can receive that peace. When you forgive somebody like Dylan, you're not letting him off the hook. You're letting yourself off the hook. So there's no reason for you to even have to understand why he did what he did. No. It's, it's what God's doing in your heart. It's what God's doing in my heart. As a matter of fact, even if I was to talk to Dylan about why he did what he did, I don't think he would even take the time to explain that to me. So it really doesn't matter. And, and uh, call to forgive again. Where, where can they get the book, Pastor? The book can be found on Amazon.com. It could also be found at BethanyHouse.com. It can be found in Books a Million. It can be found in Lifeway. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, I really recommend the book. We want to get back. We're going to take a break right now. We want to get back and talk to you about that racial reconciliation and the truth of what biblical forgiveness is and what cultural forgiveness is. We'll be right back after this. Our culture is moving away from a biblically-based lifestyle faster than ever in history. Even many believers struggle to explain their own viewpoint on who Jesus really is. God says in the Old Testament that my people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. That's why TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Lacey, a program that discusses biblical issues and how they relate to our culture today. Now in our second season, Viewpoint is hitting more topics head on than ever this year. Every Viewpoint program is produced without any commercial advertising, so no topics are off limits. But we couldn't do this show without the support of our financial partners. Maybe you've never supported a Christian media ministry before, but in today's world, our message is needed more than ever, and it only takes a minute to give. Go to WTLW.com and click Get Involved, then Donate. Your gift of $20, $50, or even $100 will help continue the outreach of TV44's Viewpoint program to impact your hometown and the world. I'm back with Pastor Anthony Thompson. He is the author of Call to Forgive, the dramatic book of uh, what God's done in his life uh, in forgiving the, uh, the killer of not only his wife but eight other people in Charleston, South Carolina in uh, 2015 as they were actually in prayer at the time. And uh, Pastor, there's, there's a lot of people who would say that what you did for Dylan Roof at his bond hearing when you said you're forgiven and you really ought to look at receiving Christ, that that was, that was too easy for him, that for some reason uh, the forgiveness was too easy, that uh, they, he should really acknowledge what he did, and somehow you're, you're excusing what he did by forgiving him. Is that true? No, that's not true. That's what you call cultural or worldly forgiveness. 
biblical forgiveness says that the perpetrator or the offender is not going to get away with what they've done wrong. It's just the fact that you're forgiving them because you look at them the same way you look at yourself. You know, in the eyes of God, we're all sinners. He's a sinner. I'm a sinner. God forgave me, so why can't in my heart forgive Dylan Roof? And at the same time, he's serving life sentences. He's serving death sentences. So he didn't get away. He didn't get away with anything. He's still being punished. And you're still praying for him. Every day, twice a day. People can find that very, very difficult to believe when they know how much Myra meant to you and, and the, the other families, the other, the other uh, yeah. part of the, the Charleston Nine. Uh, mental health providers tell us that anger is a real part of the yeah. grieving process. And you're telling me in this book that you, that was never part of the grief that you went through. There was other parts of the grief that you did go through that process, but anger was never part of that. Never, never, never part of that with Dylan. First of all, the Lord caught me in time. He caught me within 48 hours after this happened to forgive Dylan and gave me that peace. And once I experienced that peace, anger was nowhere in the picture. Anger will never be in the picture because first of all, you know, I don't hold anything against Dylan because knowing my wife, my wife, this is what she would want. She would want me to forgive Dylan. She would want to see Dylan appear one day in heaven where she is so she can say, here, you finally made it. Now you know things are not as bad as they were. Yes, that, that's, that's just her. How, how, does that, how does that differ from cultural forgiveness? I mean, when we're talking about yeah. uh, the way the way people expect us to forgive. How does biblical yeah. forgiveness differ? Well, biblical for forgiveness differ in the sense that you're not, trying, you're not trying to receive peace by taking revenge or holding a grudge or being angry at the person. Whereas in biblical forgiveness, whereas in cultural forgiveness, people feel that, you know, they can forgive somebody and at the same time, they can still be angry at this person for whatever reason. Also, they believe that the person has to accept their forgiveness in order for them to, to be forgiven. But that's not true, you know, because, first of all, God forgives you. You ask God to forgive you, you're forgiven. You ask the other person to forgive you, if they don't forgive you, you're still forgiven, you know, because you've done what God asked you to do. Yeah. What, what could happen in our country if true repentance was, was offered and, uh, and biblical forgiveness was given in exchange for that between the races, between blacks and whites primarily for what we've seen happen in this country since the 1500s. What could happen yeah. in, the, in the United States if true biblical forgiveness took place between the races? If true biblical forgiveness took place, that same peace that I experienced when it comes to black and white, the, the harm and the hurt and the pain and suffering that our ancestors were faced with, and we were faced with too in different ways, we would receive peace automatically, immediately, you know, without having to do anything except forgive. And then in turn, by forgiving those who did us harm, it's like burning heaps of coal on their heads, hoping that from this, they'll come to a right understanding, a right heart, and they'll change you know, and have a better attitude in life. So it's, 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 more, it's, more about, it's more about giving than receiving. And that's something that uh, you, you kind of struggled with a little bit when, God, when you realized God was calling you to an expanded part of your ministry, something that was kind of adding on to the ministry you already had. Uh, tell us about how that's, how that's come about. Well, I didn't want to do it. He told me this at the barn hearing. He, as soon as I received that peace, the next thing he said is, your mission is to spread the gospel. I didn't think about it then, but as, as a couple of months went by, it really sank in. And I just faced him one day. I told him, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I, I said, I don't care what you do. You could burn the house down. You could throw lightning bolts, you know, thunderstorms. I don't care what you say. I'm not going to do it. I can't because how could you expect me to do something like this? And I'm still mourning. Then how am, how am I going to do this? I don't have the power to do it. Of course, he wasn't saying anything. I did all the talking. <laughs> but, by time, but by the time I got up off that floor, because I cried. I mean, I was just like, I'm not going to do it. I cried. But by the time I got up off the floor, all I can remember is I'm now doing it. 
so God won. And he's you know, equipped. But I, and he's equipped and he to has do a, it. He has equipped me to do it. I mean, everything that has taken place, the book, that's all God. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that is happening, the people he put me in front of to spread the gospel is all God. You know, and, and all he wanted me to do is be obedient. That's all he wants any of us to do. Be obedient. Let him have control. He called you to do something, but he'll be the one to make it, do, make it happen. Yeah. Do you think, and this is a tough question because we've got to get in other people's minds and spirits, but when we see the, the, the other situations that have taken place, like Michael Brown and Freddie Gray and uh, Eric Garner and some of those people, do you think if the families would have stood up and, and forgiven those police officers, and I don't want to put that in their, you know, project yeah, God yeah. into them, would, would the results of that, could that have been different, you think? I mean, we, we saw the violence. We saw the response. Mm -hmm. We saw the violence. I believe, yeah, it could have been different. I'm not, it could have been different for the victims. If the victims had forgiven the police officers, mm -hmm. it, would have been, it would have been much different for them because by doing that, that peace that they tried to, it, it, that they sought through violence and, 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 and burning down cities, they would have got that peace much more quicker by just saying, I, I forgive you. Mm -hmm. You know, now as far as the police officers and those involved, I can't say what it may have done to their lives, but I do know if the victims have forgiven them, they would have received the peace they're looking for now. Yeah. What, I know that. Was there, was there a price that you, that you paid immediately after forgiving Dylan? I mean, either internally in your own spirit or a price that maybe well-meaning Christians were exacting on you. Was there a price that you paid? Oh, yeah, because people came at me, particularly my own race, and they thought I was a cop-out. You know, they thought I was experiencing uh, post-traumatic uh, post -traumatic slavery sy syndrome. Uh. And, and my point was, not really. How could I experience that? I'm not a slave. <laughs> you know, but, so things like that. And then, of course, you know, I lost my wife. Yeah. You know, I mean... She was the greatest possession I had. Yeah, she was, You know, she was all, yeah. Explain that again, you said post-traumatic slavery. Center. A lot of, especially white yeah. people, aren't gonna understand what you're talking about, but there's a, mm -hmm. there's a thing where blacks have been called for, on for years to forgive mm -hmm. the historical slavery, to forgive those things, just so they yeah. could get on with their own lives, and it was easy forgiveness to the white person. Like, yeah, explain that. And well, people were accusing you of that. Yeah, people accusing me of when 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 our ancestors were slaves, and they would they would just excuse the action because it didn't matter what they say or how they said or whether they said anything or not, <coughs> they were going to be hanged, hung, mm -hmm. or something was going to happen to them. So the better the better route was to say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to take this with a grain of sand, so I can my life can be a little better maybe for a few seconds today, and I'm just going to leave it alone. That's the what they call the post-traumatic slave syndrome, you know, that I have. But yeah. as I said, I'm not a slave. And I'm not, I didn't do this to satisfy Dylan, hoping that he wouldn't do me any wrong. So they really had the wrong interpretation about why I did this. Yeah, about what, and, and what about biblical forgiveness is all about. Biblical forgiveness is strictly what Christ went to the cross for when he died on that cross. 500 years before he died on that cross, Isaiah predicted that by his stripes, we will be healed. Mm -hmm. 500 years later, he died on the cross. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And we were. We were healed from all of our burdens. Sin, which is generally speaking sin, but those burdens could be anything from hate, anger, racism, discrimination. We were healed from all those things from an act of forgiveness so we can be healed today in the same way if we forgive each other. Yeah. Realistically, when you think of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, when you think mm -hmm. about that, do you have a hope that uh, for its fulfillment that there could be a, an end to that racial tension and, and even the hatred and the bigotry that, that still lives in some places in the United States? Yes, I do have a hope. I have an even much greater hope now, knowing what God did in my life and knowing what he's doing in the city of Charleston, I have a much greater hope. Now, it's not going to be 100%. Because we live in an imperfect world. Mm -hmm. But we, we're going to get close. 
We're going to get very close. You, what, what do you think some of those steps are to obliterating that color line? Well, we have to start at home. Each one of us, as an individual, start in your own family. You know, you go next door. Or you, 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 go, you go to a person's house of a different color who lives next door to you or lives near to you or, or attend the same church you do or work with you and say, hey, you know, let's go out to dinner or, or go to their house and say, my name is Bob. You know, what's your name? Who is your family? Look beyond color. Look beyond cultural differences. Look beyond the language barriers. Look beyond all that thing because we define each other by those things, but that is not the definition of any one of us. We, we can only be defined by who we really are, and the only way to know who we really are is to communicate with one another. Wow. Well, we know that biblical forgiveness works. It worked in Corey Ten Boom's life. It worked in the, the families of the Amish in uh, Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. It worked with Nelson Mandela yeah. and, and uh, 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 Desmond Tutu. Well, we know now that it worked in your life, and you're yes. living proof that it worked. The book is yes. called To Forgive. And uh, tell us again, Anthony, where that's available. It can be found on Amazon.com, BethanyHouse.com, Books a Million, Lifeway, and um, I'm not sure, another bookstore, but those bookstores, you can't find it. Yeah. A lot of them. Well, Anthony, thank you again so much for being with us today, and we'll continue to pray that this ministry that God's called you to will, have, will bear lots of fruit. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for making this possible, too, for spreading that. Appreciate it, Bob. TV44 created Viewpoint with Bob Placey to let everyone know that the Bible is still relevant today. Viewpoint is not only available on TV44's powerful broadcast stations and cable systems covering Northwest Ohio, but additionally, anyone can watch programs and exclusive bonus features on YouTube. And we've expanded Viewpoint's reach as you can now listen at work or in your car on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast. Would you like to help expand our reach? Then sign into YouTube with your account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now could do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places even missionaries can't reach. Help us today reach the world. Share Viewpoint with Bob Lacey today. You can find out more about today's guest on our website. And I want to let you know there are two great ways to help spread the word about the show. One, we'd appreciate your financial support as Viewpoint has no advertising. It's supported by you. The second, log on to YouTube and find our Viewpoint interviews and like, subscribe, and share with your friends. The more people who like our YouTube videos, the better chance our gospel message can rise to the top of search engines and help others learn about the truth of the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. Remember, you can share all the Viewpoint interviews you've seen today online at YouTube. And you can listen to the Viewpoint podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and anywhere you can listen to a podcast. <laughs>